Okay, so let's get started. We have joining us today, uh, Kyle Mo. Kyle Mo is coming from uh, Harvard GSD, where he's an associate professor in architecture and energy. Um, he's also co-director of the MDES uh, program for advanced studies, uh, co-director of energy and environments uh, concentration there, and director of energy, environments, and design research unit at GSD. Uh, Kyle has uh, won a number of awards uh, recently, 2016-2017 Fulbright Distinguished uh, Chair in Helsinki, Finland. He's been a Rome Prize Fellow in Architecture and three fellowships at the McDowell Co Colony uh, uh, um, uh, supporting his research. He has an uh, uh, amazing publishing record, probably publishing more books than we can read at a, at a rate that we can read. Um, uh, from uh, recently Empire, S Empire State and Building, an ACTAR 2016 book, Insulating Modernism, Isolated and Non-Isolated Thermodynamics and Architecture in 2014, uh, The Hierarchy of Energy in Architecture and in Energy Analysis in 2015, Convergence and Architectural Agenda for Energy in 2013, uh, Currently working on uh, books called What is Energy and How Else Might We Think About It with Sanford Quinter. Uh, and wood urbanism from molecular to territorial. So uh, a wide range of publishing. Uh, and uh, uh, Kyle is a graduate of UVA, um, uh, the Master of Architecture program. Uh, he's referenced a lot, as you probably, uh, your faculty are uh, continuously referencing the work he's done. So let's welcome back to Building Matters and uh, the Building Lecture Series, Kyle Mo. Okay, so um, thank you very much for having me, the invitation, Ed and Seth. It's, it's really fantastic to be here. I love coming back to Charlottesville anytime I can, um, and it's, it's a pleasure to be back in this room. I have many great memories of lectures in this room, so I'm honored to be here. Um, so um, Ed asked me to speak about um, some of my wood research. Uh, on wood buildings and uh, how they perform at, at multiple scales. And um, I'll certainly be doing that. Uh, and to do so, we're going to focus on this one uh, ambitiously modest building called the Stack House. But for, before we get into that, because I'm giving kind of two back to back lectures, I want to start with a slightly more general topic that helps connect uh, the various architectural, technical, historical, ecological, and political aspects of, of my work as an architect and teacher. So, um, in as much as it might help set up both today and tomorrow's lectures, uh, I want to ask you to think about the appearance of architecture. That is, I think it's worthwhile uh, today to consider the witting and unwitting ways architects determine the appearance of architecture. Um, I was turned on to this topic um, by the architectural historian James Ackerman, who shifted his attention to the role of magnificence, or the state of splendid appearance, as he saw it manifest in Palladio's work. Ackerman reflected on magnificence in terms of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics as speculation on how people might best live and thus design. <clears throat> While Ackerman was largely concerned with the virtue and virtuosity of Palladio's public works, questions about the appearance and the possible magnificence of architecture today necessarily invokes other domains of design. The splendid appearance of a building now implicates not only the outward character of an object, like Palladio's grand facades, but also invokes other architectural questions concerning how buildings actually come to appear in the world in the most literal, energetic, and material terms, such as their planetary modes of production, their energetic, material, and carbon flow fields, and how architecture appears to the visual and non-visual sensory apparatus of our bodies. It also concerns, perhaps more critically, the otherwise unquestioned methods and frames of reference we use as designers to engender and describe the appearance of architectural artifacts and phenomena. In my view, only a deliberate convergence of these inextricable causes of appearance might engender a magnificent act of architecture today. This convergence thus situates the notion of appearance in a more contingent and open and thus architecturally ambitious context. As such, appearance raises a couple of deceptively simple questions that are at the core of design from my point of view, which is what actually causes architecture to appear the way it does today? And perhaps more importantly, how else might architecture come to appear?
So for today's lecture, we're going to consider various types of appearance as they cut across a range of spatial and temporal scales um, as they relate to even the most humble of wood buildings, um, which in this case is this building called the Stack House. Um, <clears throat> So this is one of um, nine buildings that I built for a, a, a client in the high country of Colorado. Um, these are buildings that I designed and built myself, usually with friends and students. Um, and so we're in the central Colorado on the Arkansas River. Um, it's one valley east of Aspen, but a very different place than Aspen, a very dry, uh, desert-like climate, uh, but nonetheless along a major North American river. Um, this building is, is very remote, uh, but it is not isolated. It's extremely connected, and I'll, I'll show you how. Um, it's on a fantastic site, uh, about 9,000 feet above sea level, uh, overlooking the Arkansas River Valley. And uh, in the distance there, um, this happens to be Mount Harvard, uh, of all places. Uh, Mount Oxford is over there. Um, but it's looking at a range, this collegiate peak range of 14,000 foot peaks. Um, so quite an interesting site. Um, you can't really drive to the site, everything I carried up uh, to this site. Um, and I want to give you a very quick tour so you know what this building is. It won't take long because it's very small, 12 feet by 36 feet by 20 feet tall. Um, but everything um, that we're going to talk about are, are really the walls and the floor. Um, the walls are six by eight spruce timbers. And so that's everything that uh, it's, it's the structure, it's the enclosure, it's the finished materials, it's what architects call insulation, um, air barriers, water barriers, all those sorts of things are all handled in this five and a half inches of wood. Um, but again, to give you a little bit of a tour, here's the very simple plan. I, I, I have to continuously argue with my colleagues that um, all of the various types of uh, complexity and intricacy and differentiated repetition and accumulation, et cetera, these things that we might talk about in studio are deeply embedded in this project, even though it's just two parallel walls. Um, I think all of its meaningful complexity is, is simply in the non-visual field, and I'll uh, reveal that to you uh, in this lecture. Um, so we have two walls, uh, a few windows, uh, a roof. Um, and the walls are kind of interesting, even from a structural point of view. Um, if this is the fully built wall, it has to start out as a, a three-foot beam that's spanning these uh, concrete pillars uh, so that I can then, therefore, build the floor attached to those beams, uh, which becomes the kind of you know, face of the scaffolding for the construction site. So at times, this, this wall is behaving as a, a deep very deep beam, a 19, 20 foot deep beam for spanning 14, 15 feet. Um, very efficient, um, or very inefficient, sorry. Um, but there's other times where it behaves like a masonry wall because most of the load um, moves, not unlike a, a masonry wall, like most of the loads are transferred to those uh, pillars in a particular pattern. And actually very little of the wall is held up by that three foot uh, deep beam. So. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of very much a composite building in that sense so that it behaves often like a beam and often like a wall. Um, there's a series of, of window boxes, um, thermal bridging window boxes um, that um, frame very particular views of the landscape. There's a big window facing direct south. Um, some of the other, there's a waterfall over here. There's a, uh, on Mount Oxford, this my client's uh, business partner died in a ski avalanche accident, um, so that's framed, et cetera. Uh, we framed some of the other buildings that we've built out there. He framed one very low window for his grandchildren to get in knock, you know, knock, you know, kind of involved in this cult of the river. He's a, an Olympic kayaker. Um, uh, there's one tree that just looks at a, a pine tree. That's mostly more about scent than view. Um, and these little windows have uh, their doors are, are, have a chalkboard on the inside face, and every time you go there, somebody's written something else on it. And um, but especially when it's closed up, I quite enjoy this building out in the middle of nowhere, murmuring to itself things from E. Cummings or Byron or something like that. It's, it's great. One of the windows is quite high; you can't see out of it. It's only for the western setting sun, and it turns the uh, interior orange at certain parts of the day. 
but um, it's really more about the aspects of its construction that are of interest to this lecture, this course. Um, I'll talk about the, uh, the roof briefly. There's a kind of asymmetrical curve um, to the roof as it meets the eastern wall, uh, where it meets the where the roof meets the uh, western wall, it's dead flat. So if you connect the dots, it's a ruled surface. So every one of the joists is slightly different than the one before and after it. Um, it added 18 minutes to the construction process. Not a big deal. Um, but produces a roof like this, which the building inspector thought was failing uh, when he came to inspect it. Uh, but part roof, part skate park uh, during construction. Um, and when you enter the building from the north side, um, you can barely detect um, in perspective that asymmetrical curve uh, given the light and geometry. But when you're up on the south end of the building, you can very much see uh, the belly of this roof um, as it bounces light around and bounces sound around. Um, this building is used in many different ways, um, including the production of Mamma Mia that his grandkids uh, performed uh, the day of its opening. Uh, but there's a lot of music. Um, a lot of painting, a lot of yoga that goes on there. Um, but I'm going to speak mostly about the uh, wood walls. Um, the kind of focus uh, of most of this building's appearance. Um, so again, it's it's everything that a, a contemporary wall needs to be doing is, is handled with with this quite uh, very low quality wood uh, milled in a very low quality way. Um, and what I want to do today is basically just walk through a set of scales from the molecular to the territorial to give you a sense of how this, this building is extremely contingent uh, on, on a whole set of, uh, of systems. Um, so the, I'm going to start at a fairly small scale, a um, scale of our body, very familiar. Um, and one thing I can tell you about this building is that this building does not meet the energy code. It fails quite miserably uh, if it's... The energy code tells us a wall needs to be R19 or R26 or something like that. This is R5.5, um, so it's a it's a, a sustainable failure, of course. Um, but this guy will call me in the middle of February when it's well below zero, multiple feet of snow outside, and he's inside this building in t-shirt and shorts, painting and doing yoga. And there's no pipes, there's no wood stoves, there's no wires or anything inside this building. It's just a big pile of wood uh, and a big window and his body. Um, and there's a whole set of reasons uh, for why that can occur. Um, a whole set of uh, physical properties, material properties, physiological properties um, that uh, produce that level of comfort in a building like this. Um, one of the most interesting is thermal effusivity, which rarely shows up um, in any building science tech bu textbook. Um, but it's quite interesting. Um, it's the factor, um, the easiest way to explain it is if I had two blocks of wood, or two blocks of material in here, one, one steel and one wood, and they were, let's say they've been in here for a month, they're exactly the same temperature, uh, and you touch the piece of steel, and then you touch the piece of wood, the wood would feel, what's that? Warmer. Warmer, right? They're exactly the same temperature, but one feels warm, one feels cold, right? So what effusivity is measuring, or an, uh, an index of, is if this is our um, skin here, that uh, we lose or we transfer much greater thermal energy um, to steel, copper, stone, and concrete than we do softwoods and cork and those sorts of things. So um, steel has a, you know 40 times the effusivity of, of softwood, looks like spruce in this building. And so there's a kind of very quantifiable but very qualitative understanding of how our bodies relate to wood. So in my mind, uh, we should have a completely different energy code for buildings that have wood interiors and wood structures than we do all the other building materials, right? But right now we're penalized for that. But nonetheless, you can have a, a, a body quite comfortable um, given the effusivity of wood um, versus these other materials, even if the temperature is much lower, right? So, and if you can, you can follow this through various architectures. Frank Lloyd Wright was sort of, had an intuition about this. He could never tell you what it was, but um, the way he disposed materials, uh, in this case of the Jacobs house, um, various thermally active surfaces or just wood, the, the warm facing 
uh, Southern Sun, et cetera, um, that he was actually quite interested in how, how bodies reacted um, in response to various materials. Uh, but again, could never really articulate it. He just had good intuitions about it. Another aspect of this building um, that it helps ex us understand why it behaves the way it does is the thermal diffusivity of wood. Um, again, this is another property uh, that rarely shows up in building science courses or textbooks, but I think is deeply important. Um, it's uh, basically thermal diffusivity deals with the volumetric propagation of thermal energy inside of a material. Um, this is important because buildings are really heavy. Um, what you've learned about conductivity, uh, which is part of the equation of thermal diffusivity, is important to understand, but it's basically the kind of instantaneous transfer of thermal energy across a material. Um, this is relevant for very thin materials like plates of steel, plates of glass, et cetera. But once you get into more, any more massive materials, concrete, rammed earth, wood, et cetera, um, then thermal diffusivity becomes much more important. Uh, conductivity is assumed to be instant, um, whereas diffusivity is very transient in its behavior, so it's very dependent on time, which I like as an architect. Um, so if we just walk through this equation, conductivity, which you can imagine, basically the velocity of thermal energy moving through the molecules of a material divided by the density. I hope you all know what density is. Um, that's pretty in easy to intuitive, the relationship between conductivity and density. Uh, specific heat capacity, have you heard about it? Probably have heard about it. Um, I hope you know, your, your professor is saying you have, so you have. Um, so here's some of the specific heat values for various materials. One basic question for you is why is oak, why is water so high? I'll remind you, by the way, that specific heat is the amount of energy it requires to raise a material like one unit, like one degree Fahrenheit or whatever unit you might be using. So what's going on there? What's up? Are you saying oak is more dense than gold, steel? What do you think? No, it's good. Just think about what's going on at the molecular level. You're thinking about it in the right way. The internal molecular structure? Yeah, that's great. Let's think about that. All right, so let's look at that. So what's going on when a material heats up, this phenomenon of something warming up, is that the molecules start moving more and more, right? And the more degrees of freedom that a molecule has, the more it can move around before it starts to heat up, right? So when we look at this list, basically we're looking at gold has just a few degrees of freedom because it is so dense. You were thinking about densities right, but just in the wrong direction. Um, that gold is very dense, so it can't, its molecules can't move very much. So that heat or that thermal energy gets converted to heat quite quickly, so it warms up the material. Water has many degrees of freedom, more, many more than like most of the building materials. So that's why it takes so much energy input to start to raise the temperature of a body of water, right? Does that make sense? Yes, it's, it's, it, well, it, I mean, it's, yes, it's saying the same thing. It's, it's liquid because it has so many degrees of freedom and it's, it's a liquid because it, yeah, vice versa. Um, and obviously oak is fairly interesting because it's a building material that has quite a bit of water in it, right? Various densities or, or various amounts of water. Um, so that's why it has um, a higher diffusivity value, right? So this is fairly interesting for how our, our bodies might relate to a space as well. Um, now, the thing you probably do know about uh, specific heat density is that it's very much related to um, various processes of latent and sensible heat, right? So when we're just putting in, when we're you know, in introducing um, energy into a body of water and we're trying to boil it, we know that there's this quite long period um, where we're putting energy in, but it's not really uh, changing the sensible temperature at all, right? And that's the period in which we're just moving all of those molecules and all of their degrees of freedom. And then at some point, we've exhausted all that movement, and then you start to get the change in thermal temperature, right? Now, this is quite interesting for how a building out in the middle of nowhere can behave the way it does thermally. Um, 
both heating up and cooling down. Um, so this is a, a chart that compares conductivity and, and diffusivity. Uh, this is a Michael Ashby chart who's a material scientist. These graphs are very useful once you start to understand how to use them. Um, in this case, he's showing us how to design a, a trom wall that the closer we get to this crossing, um, the better the materials are for, the better the material properties are for the kind of performance of a trom wall. So stone and concrete, these kind of heavy materials that you know to put behind a wood wall, but, or behind a trom wall. Uh, I'm not designing a trom wall in the case of the stack house. I'm doing something else. Um, so um, I want a, a lower value of diffusivity and a lower level of conductivity so that I don't lose whatever heat gains I have from the interior in the winter too quickly. Um, and I want that heat to propagate a little bit more slowly. Um, so uh, in this sense, if you want to think about it in, this, in terms of thermal diffusivity, wood is somewhere between the uh, cellular solids of the foams and the more dense uh, building materials like stone and concrete, et cetera. Um, in other words, the cellular solid structure of wood as a material um, starts to ha exhibit some of the behaviors of, you know, the kind of structural capacity of some of these materials, but uh, because it's so full of air and full of water at different points, uh, it exhibits other kinds of properties that are useful. So in the end, if I'm just looking at one of my six by eight spruce timbers and I'm, you know, maybe putting in some kind of heat gain into this material, I'm very interested in how it's going to propagate over time. And it's going to move in very different um, velocities and directions based on whether it's uh, perpendicular to the grain, parallel to the grain, uh, tangential to the grain, et cetera. Um, that all of that's related to how that heat is moving and what it's doing inside of this uh, otherwise pretty dumb piece of wood. Um, all of that adds up to the penetration depth, basically how far uh, that heat uh, extends into the wood over a certain period of time. And so over the course of an hour or over the course of the day, um, I can, you know, basically store some heat in that wood and then it'll re-radiate uh, at a, a temperature that is quite comfortable to us. Um, and I'll just say, we'll, we'll cover some more aspects of, of these kinds of the scale of uh, thermal behavior and a relationship to our bodies and to architecture in the lecture tomorrow in uh, Eric's class, uh, which is this book about insulating modernism. Um, but um, I want to jump up and scale. Those are just a couple of kind of observations about our bodies and, and, and how wood might work. Um, I want to jump up and scale to the kind of, let's say, a regional view of this tiny little building. Uh, and to do so, I'm going to use uh, my background in energy analysis, which is basically ecosystem analysis of, of, of buildings, which is the basis of this book that Seth mentioned, The Hierarchy of Energy in Architecture. Um, so um, this might seem a little arcane or something, but energy is basically just the amount of energy. It's the kind of historical counting of how much energy goes into a, a building or a process or your body, et cetera. Um, and Although architects have historically been preoccupied with things like operational energy use, that's what, when architects use the word energy, they're usually thinking about heating, lighting, cooling, et cetera. Um, they do so because they routinely confuse the word fuel for energy. Um, but this has historically been the kind of focus of, let's say, a certain type of pedagogy and a certain type of practice in architecture. Recently, of course, we've begun to expand our scope or what we envision the energetic constitution of a building to be uh, quite appropriately. So we're starting to think about how, where materials come from, how they're you know, processed, uh, et cetera, and what happens to them uh, after the fact. Um, so that's the kind of basis of life cycle analysis, which you've probably heard of to some respect. Um, but uh, this energy, this ecosystem analysis um, is really important because it's the only one that doesn't treat the uh, materials of the world as an infinite resource. Um, so energy includes the amount of energy it takes to, let's say, grow a tree for, that we use, end up using in a wood building. So if you're interested in this, um, I think, unfortunate term, sustainability, um, then you would, um, I would, you would have to start to uh, take account of uh, all the energy it takes to make the world work the way it does. Um, so it, there's a, 
it seems relatively minor uh, in this chart, but it's ex extremely significant uh, in terms of how we're going to support life uh, in this century. Um, so to do so, we really have to follow uh, energy as at uh, you know 98.5% of all of our exergy, all of our available energies comes from the sun, um, and how that strikes the planet and moves through all these systems, let's say through a forest, into a wood building, maybe to heating our bodies, et cetera, and how energy and information and materials flow back through that system, constantly cascading back and forth is, is what energy is taking account of, right? So uh, again, I have to take account of the energy it takes to grow a tree, maintain a forest, et cetera, to think about um, the energetic aspects of, of one of my small uh, wood buildings. Um, so what this book did was just do one of, the, or did the most comprehensive energy analysis, ecosystem analysis of a building anywhere. And this is the School of Construction Management at the University of Florida, which is a, a quite um, banal building. Um, and it's doing all the stuff you're supposed to do with um, solar angles and you know various things to make a lead gold um, building, but we're not interested in that. Uh, we're interested in the ecosystem um, that's behind this building. Um, and so we map out every flow of material and energy through this, through the, the building itself, um, various types of waste, et cetera. And we tabulate all of that um, in some quite boring spreadsheets um, with enormous uh, values attached to them uh, because that's what energy is. Um, and we establish what is we call the hierarchy of energy for this building, um, which is you know enormous orders of magnitude uh, cascading down through the system. But you can see some things like climates and construction materials. But what's so interesting about this um, and the primary outcome of this kind of book is that once you or reorganize all of these um, parts of the hierarchy of energy of a building, um, about 80% of the building is dealing with construction and maintenance, and only about 20% is anything to do with heating, lighting, and cooling, et cetera. Um, in other words, in my view, and in the, from an ecosystem point of view, we've, we've developed very elaborate systems and ratings and policies, et cetera, uh, for the wrong energetic questions. I think the, the more intense uh, energetic questions, the most energetic constitution of a building is dealing with construction and maintenance and how things happen over time. This is an 80-20 split. Um, so you can see anything you're doing with energy efficiency, as they call it these days. Um, if you make your building, you know, f like whatever, twice as efficient from an energetic point of view operationally, then you have a 90-10 split, and you have a bigger question about the ecology of a building. Um, we're in 80-20. That's in Florida. In Italy, you know, comparable um, peer-reviewed studies. You're at an 85-15 split because they don't have air conditioning, basically, is the difference. Um, so again, with, with this ecosystem analysis, we're thinking about how energy comes from the sun, moves through, let's say, is absorbed by trees, converges into lumber, converges into walls, converges into a building, and then how it feeds back into the system and back and forth again and again. Um, so this, in my view, completely transforms what we need to think of the building as. It's uh, no longer a building as an object, but a, a process, often a process of urbanization, even of very rural parts, uh, like the high country of Colorado. Um, so when we think about this wood at this kind of scale, at the kind of ecosystem scale, a lot of things change. Of course, I could have built this building like you're probably taught how to build, which is studs and plywood and insulation and finished materials and rain screens and um, probably various layers of petroleum uh, sheets uh, as air barriers, etc. Um, this is the basis of many buildings that I've built uh, in various places and um, it's the basis of most construction in the world. But of course when you start to consider um, all of those processes and, and, and geographies that are attached to that um, this is just a simple embodied energy calculation, but uh, let's just say for produce uh, these walls, 43,000 megajoules, and what I describe as a very vulgar material geography. Um, by that, I mean that um, we specify all of these distances, we specify this geography, but in no way does it reinforce, I'd say, the appearance of the building. Um, and so I'm not partial to that as an architect. Um, in this stack approach, um, all of this uh, material is beetle kill uh, material. So 
as part of climate change processes in the high country of Colorado, this, this Engelmann spruce species is dying off because there's a beetle um, that doesn't die in the winter as it used to and, and takes over the tree and kills it. So there's a lot of standing uh, spruce out there that ought to be used for something. Uh, construction is a good use of this kind of material. Um, so all of this material is harvested in the same uh, Arkansas River Valley. It's it air dried in this desert-like climate uh, by the sun and wind. Um, it's milled at a local mill, very low tech, very uh, poor mill um, in this valley. And of course that ends up with a very different sort of energetic value attached to it. But more importantly, a very different geography attached to that, which um, I think might be the source of uh, some virtue um, that I'm designing at the same time that I'm designing um, all those thermal behaviors in a wall. If you're ambitious and you want to be thinking about um, how life is going to be supported in the century, then carbon is quite important to you. Um, and wood buildings have um, a very interesting property, which is that they're the only building material that um, sequesters material as they grow, or so, so, sorry, sequesters carbon as, the, as this tree grows. Um, all the other building materials basically require quite a bit of carbon to produce them, et cetera. Um, so the, the sequestration of carbon and of, let's say of larger bodies of forests um, is quite important. And this is a study from um, Chad Oliver at Yale Forestry, uh, which is looking at the relationship between building, uh, like wood building products and forests, and the kind of net effect of how much carbon can be sequestered, <laughs> especially if you have very intentional cuts or you know harvests of that wood, that the overall um, carbon that we can trap, uh, retain in forests is, is, is much greater if we in fact cut wood rather than not cut wood, which is uh, the, the problem with the so-called conservation ethic, uh, especially in the northeast of the United States, where nobody wants to cut down a tree. Uh, it's the worst thing you can do for a forest. So with that in mind, um, because I'm using uh, such an inefficient use of material in this project, uh, an excess, an abundance of wood, um, the, the two walls and the solid wood floor of this building sequester you know, 17 and a half thousand kilograms of, of carbon um, equivalent, right? And if you subtract out uh, all the carbon costs for processing those timbers themselves, as long with the other wood materials, the steel, the glazing, the concrete, the rubber roof membrane, et cetera, all that adds up to about 9,000 kilograms of carbon sequestered in this wood. Um, in other words, this building sequesters about twice as much carbon as it took to make it, which might sound, um, uh, impressive or something, um, but I can assure you that this is a nothing, uh, means nothing in terms of the order of magnitudes involved with the carbon cycle. Um, but um, if similar kinds of thinking were applied to other forms of construction around the world, um, then maybe there's some role for architecture in the question of, of carbon. Um, so um, again, as we're as we're thinking about how energy and material, carbon and information are, are cascading through these various uh, systems that are attached to this building and are inextricable from this building, um, I've gotten much more specific about um, my carbon analysis of this project um, for, for this uh, new book that we're finishing right now. Um, so I've extended the analysis of, um, and updated the analysis uh, from an ecosystem base and carbon base from not only the stack and the stick approach, but uh, the kind of current fascination with cross-laminated timber construction. Um, so looking at uh, a five-layer um, spruce panel um, versus the six by eight stack, and then the, of course the, the, the stick approach. And just looking at that in a, a, number, of, uh, a number of different ways, um, this is just, um, this is something that I just do automatically now with projects. I think you should know how much stuff there is in your project, uh, how much your building weighs, but not for the reason that Bucky Fuller asked you. Um, but basically, every interesting uh, ecological and architectural parameter from my point of view is attached to the mass of a building as an uh, extensive property. Um, so the first thing I do is, is compare the mass of various buildings. and. I'm looking at CLT as it's produced uh, in North America right now and in, in, in different parts, uh, different regions. 
that might be the source of a panel uh, for a project like this. Um, so obviously the, the uh, frame, you know, the stick frame is the lightest, uh, but that, that, that'll have some liabilities later. Uh, the production energy, so producing a CLT panel in a factory obviously requires much more industrial processes uh, to produce it, so it has a much higher embodied energy, much higher embodied carbon, of course. Um, this air-dried um, solid timbers, it's, it's almost unprocessed wood, it's just, you know, shaping it up uh, on a couple of cuts. Um, and producing things like plywood are much more intensive, so that's a slightly higher value there. Um, if we start to look at transportation, um, that's a, that's a huge factor. I had a really wonderful uh, student from Harvard College do a thesis with me. Uh, he was uh, an environmental studies student. He was quite interested in the role of, of, of wood buildings, uh, what they could be in this century. And he ended up with this very simple parameter of how much wood can you get on various types of trucks. And therefore, with the amount of carbon that's sequestered in that much wood, how far can you drive before you've canceled out yourself, right? Very simple parameter, um, but if we're for this project in Colorado, and you might specify quite unwittingly a panel from any one of these places because you're just trying to do a cool wood building, right? And so, but you you would also be specifying um, very different types of carbon, you know, footprints associated with that with that project. So, uh, in this case of this very local um, carbon and you know and uh, fiscal economy. Um, it's, it's a, almost a non-factor uh, for, the, for the stack approach. Um, so again, this kind of regional approach, um, again, this is one explanation of how a building appears, right? Um, but we're also creating other types of appearance of, of carbon emissions, uh, entropy, et cetera, when we make these, these sorts of choices. Um, so this is the energy analysis. Um, so we're looking at, um, Again, the amount of exergy required to produce uh, the, the construction system uh, in this case. And you can see a whole order of magnitude difference between uh, the CLT approach and, and the other uh, approaches. And uh, order of magnitude is huge. Uh, I don't know if you, these numbers can be a little bit scary or a little bit maybe unfamiliar, but uh, um, when it comes to energy, I can tell you that, uh, again, we, we get overly specific in various types of calculations. Architects and engineers love to measure what's easy to measure, and not what's difficult to measure. And they love to get super specific about what is easy to measure. Our energy is much more difficult to measure. Um, and what's important is that we simply work on the right order of magnitude. And I would say that we're not doing that right now. Again, we get very specific about often trivial forms of energy associated with construction. Um, and obviously the transportation, uh, the energy associated with moving these materials around, here we see two orders of magnitude difference, or almost two orders of magnitude difference. Um, and then uh, in the end, for this kind of ecosystem analysis, we're usually most interested in the renewable energy associated with each uh, uh, system. And so uh, if you're interested in sustainability, then something like uh, this very low tech uh, but high performance um, wood building uh, bears itself out in this kind of analysis. Um, now, I, I do all this kind of work because I'm just simply curious about it. I'm curious about what building science didn't teach me, what they left out. Um, and so I, I, I do this kind of research um, with students in my lab. Um, but it's not necessarily as a matter of ecological fact. It's, it's, a, it's a question, again, of how buildings ought to appear in this century. So it's a question of disciplinary concern, not simply a, a, a matter of fact. Um, and um, again, it's, it's because this building um, uses, in a, you know, it's very inefficient in its use of wood um, that's, uh, that enables all of these sorts of properties or a certain type of appearance to come about, whether it's we're thinking about um, our kind of physiological interaction with the building or the um, you know, carbon properties that are associated with this building. Uh, it's all because it's a maximal use of wood, not a minimal use of wood or an efficient use of wood. There's uh, these almost platitudes about efficiency um, in architectural discourse as it pertains to energy. And um, I think those are quite misleading concepts um, 
think we should be interested in the overall uh, power, ecological power, architectural power of, of, of what we design, uh, rather than any kind of Calvinist um, sense of minimums and, and, and modes of efficiency. Um, so um, I bring that up just to say that this building performs the way it does architecturally, ecologically, thermally, et cetera, because a very different understanding of how energy is moving through its systems, right? So it's a very transscalar understanding of, of something even as dumb as, as, as five and a half inches of wood. Um, but I'm quite convinced um, that if you are concerned with the topic of the appearance of architecture, then you really do need to be moving from the molecular to the territorial and back and forth uh, to understand the constitution of a building today. Whether, again, whether that's a, um, a physical, the physical constitution of a building, the political constitution, ecological constitution of a building. We need to learn how to, um, let's say, identify and amplify the reciprocities between these different scales. And again, how that, you know, something like thermal effusivity or diffusivity is related to these forestry cycles and back and forth. Um, then I think we're engaging multiple modes of life and we're starting to think about how we might best live and, and thus design today. Um, I think I have a little bit more time before we do a bunch of questions. Um, I thought I would just, just for kicks, show you. That's in Colorado, very specific kind of thing. Um, I just wanted to show you a building that's more recent um, from Vermont. Um, and this is just a little bit of show and tell because I haven't shared this with Peter and Ed and everybody yet. So um, this is a little uh, building um, in Halifax, Vermont, which is uh, middle of nowhere in Vermont. I guess I tend to fall into these places. Um, so it's a, a, a big forest in a little meadow. Um, and it's a very different type of, um, this building appears in a very different way than the stack house for very specific types of reasons. Uh, here I'm using eastern white pine, which is a smaller tree, so I have smaller uh, timbers. Uh, I, I could use larger timbers, but it's much easier to source and have uh, meaning, you know, meaningful forestry practices with slightly smaller pieces of wood. So I have four by six timbers. They're tongue and groove, very much like the other project. Um, this is building uh, because it's in the east and there's a lot of moisture, et cetera, desert. Colorado, you can basically leave wood untreated, it's fine. Um, here I do have a, a kind of sacrificial cladding screen layer um, that's out of hemlock, which is a f uh, another type of species which is dying off because of a climate change bug. Uh, but basically all the hemlock needs to come down now. There, it's, it, it all grew up um, after the uh, hurricane in 28 or 1928 or 1938, I can't remember. but. Uh, all this hemlock grew up at the same time. It's a pretty low-grade quality of wood. You can maybe make some studs out of it, but it's quite good. Uh, uh, its weathering properties are quite good, um, so I use it as this very cheap um, uh, cladding for this building. Um, and it's milled by a, a local guy who's, whose family's been in this part of the country for 300 years. Um, and so um, it's very similar, a couple, you know, Simple walls, uh, a few windows. Um, there's a, a thing, I don't know if you can see it, but this is the window frame uh, that's holding the glass in place. And you can see uh, the, the four by six eastern white timbers inside of that. Um, so the, the, all the window frames are attached to the outside face of the building. And um, you know, some of you know that this is a particular Nordic architect that I like that I'm referencing, but here it's extremely important because here I'm just stacking those timbers and, you know, it'd be very easy for those walls to buckle over time. Um, so this wood frame, which is just a simple two by four piece of cedar, is screwed into the wall all the way up. Um, so in this case, the window is stiffening uh, the, the wood wall, right? Um, I think those kinds of things are interesting. Um, um, but this also, you know, it's another way of, of uh, heating up a little bit of this wood in some places on the south side of the building, et cetera. Um, the top is for glass, the bottom is for ventilation so that when you sit down low, there's a breeze. Um, but when you're walking around, you don't really notice it as much. Um, 
Uh, it's a little cabin on this side, a, a shop and studio on the side with a covered porch in between, which is where you spend uh, about five months of the year uh, in this building. Um, and this is a, a very uh, particular Norwegian wood stove. Um, basically in the 70s, the Nor do you guys know the Tiki raft, the guy who sailed across the Pacific and the Tiki? The Norwegians just loved it. He was a Norwegian explorer. And the Norwegians just went crazy over the eastern island heads. And so this is a, uh, a wood stove that they designed that uh, looks like the um, eastern island heads, but they're quite great. Uh, this is a bed looking out that window that we looked at on the other side. So you never see the window frames um, when you're in this space. And it has a, a certain um, different type of appearance um, than other, other buildings. That's just a quick little run through of how some things are slightly different once you go to a different context and, and how a building might appear differently uh, in the Northeast. You guys already have questions or do you want me to show you some more stuff? Yep. Um, with the process of hemorrhaging, does that account for like areas with loss in the system? Because I'm just imagining that big number is not in just pieces of wood, but like areas that gets lost along the way. Yeah, so one thing we're tracking in, in all of these processes is the, the entropy, right? The energy that's lost along the way. Um, so that's a, that's a major part of that. Um, and this is why, for instance, when we do energy calculations, it's deeply confusing because you're on the face of it calculating both exergy and entropy at the same time. I have no idea how you can even do that equation, but that's the basis of our energy codes. Um, and I, if that sounds arcane or something, um, I could tell you that in Switzerland, like in Geneva, Switzerland, um, you don't get an energy bill, you get an exergy bill because they bill you on the energy that's available to do work, right? Or that, you know, which makes total sense. It's a, it, it, and it flattens out a whole set of values um, in a society when you do that very simple uh, nomenclature change. Um, we use energy in this very confusing way, very confused way, uh, to refer to all kinds of processes. And uh, it's incredibly sloppy, and it's going to do us in. But um, yeah, you're correct to identify that, yeah. You want, Ed wants to see some more stuff. All right, I'm going to show you some more stuff. Um, all right, these are going to just be some uh, little tricks and things. All right, so um, one thing we're working on with uh, various wood manufacturers, because people are so interested in um, uh, CLT construction, uh, we're, we're working on uh, choked cavity convection. Um, which is this, uh, this is a very important, uh, well, he's, I guess he started as a mechanical engineer. He's a thermodynamicist, uh, Adrian Bajan. Um, and he gives us a very simple equation for thinking about how to choke a cavity um, in, in a multi-layered assembly like this, which uh, instantly you know, starts to look like uh, cross-laminated timber panels, of course. So the idea is if you have a cavity um, in any uh, you know, in a building assembly, let's say, and you have a hot side and a cold side, um, you're going to create a convective loop in that, right? So the air uh, coming in contact with this warm surface warms up, rises, you know, then inevitably meets the cool surface and drops. And so even if you have insulation all in stuffed in here, but probably in some sloppy way, you probably still have a lot of convective loops. This is one of the ways in which our values are undone very in reality very qu quickly. Um, so the idea with the choked cavity convection is that if you scale the cavity uh, in the right way, you can basically make any kind of upward force, buoyancy force, be negated by the downward force of, of the airflow. And so you can cancel each other out and uh, effectively eliminate any convective transfer in, a, in, a, in an assembly. And since you don't have any um, conductive transfer, then it's just radiant transfer left in, for that section of the panel. So part of the idea is if you take a CLT panel like this, um, there's actually quite a bit of redundant material in here from a structural point of view. And so there's some reason for removing some of that excess material and then scaling it to the right size, right? So you can let's say, have the structural performance you want, but have a lighter panel, which means you can move more of that material. It like has a, a pretty big cascading effect on the proper, uh, on the like, carbon cycle, but 
Um, but you can also increase the thermal performance of it by making it of this panel slightly lighter in this case, right? Um, so when we look at various, you know, assemblies of, uh, of cross-laminated panels, we have this big matrix of um, what the kind of difference is. And um, depending on how you scale it and uh, think about the assembly of, of the CLT panels, um, the, you know, we just call it absolute thermal resistance. Basically, the kind of net effect of introducing these types of choked cavities in here, you know, from a factor of one to a factor of 11 in, in some cases. Um, so simply by removing material, um, you can achieve this sort of thing. Um, Another thing we're working on uh, in the case of, of you, know, you know, CLT panels in particular, but also a solid wood, any solid wood assembly is this uh, German notion of tempering, which is uh, very obscure, but it comes from basically German historic preservation practice. Um, and they developed this because, um, let's say you have an old masonry villa or something like that that you need to protect. Um, you can't really put insulation on the outside because that would ruin the historic presence of that building, right? And of course, if you put insulation on the inside, you create a huge problem because that masonry actually needs a little bit of heat to keep it warm in the winter from freezing and thawing and that sort of thing. So as any number of architects have done in the Northeast, they've insulated a building to bring it up to like some passive house standard and basically in, in the process destroy a masonry wall from th freeze-thaw in a couple of cycles, right? Um, so you can't insulate the building, so what they do is they temper it uh, in the German tradition. So what they do is they just introduce a couple of small uh, hydronic tubes at the base of the wall. And so part of what they're doing is that they're uh, kind of quite directly through conduction heating up uh, this wall um, so that it you know, doesn't freeze, but also becomes a, a radiator to the inside and to the outside. Um, but it also, a very important uh, property of this is that you start to affect the uh, boundary layer condition of the air going up this, this surface. So you start to introduce a convective flow that's, that's useful as well. Uh, but in most cases, it you know, kind of disappears from a historic preservation point of view. So, um, and this, is, this goes back to a lot of Michelle Addington's research, but um, we need to be much more aware of the behavior of these boundary layers um, uh, both you know, in, our, in any building, in our bodies, et cetera, uh, because that's often what determines a lot of our, our sense of comfort. So um, those are a couple of other techniques that we're working on in the lab that I, I thought I would uh, put in here. Um, okay, but we have exactly 20 minutes for discussion. So do I need to guys get you warmed up for some questions? Who's got a question? Just Peter. I have a question on this back half. Um, to my great frustration, nothing. Uh, this is something that the client insisted upon. He had this vision of marrying his girlfriend in this building, and somehow these steps were all important. Um, I told him I was going to bury him in that cavity. Um, <laughs> when we can't, when it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I think it will be occupied at some point, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is, I mean, it, 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 that does relate to some other, um, this is a kind of specifically generic building, like I, I'm into, like a lot of studios I run, you have to, you might design a library, but you also have to show me how it's going to be reused two or three times, right? So that kind of thinking about those future uses, next uses, is something that's uh, important. Um, it's something that did come from UVA. I remember taking a course with Julie Bargman and talking about next use for all these super fun sites. And, um, I wondered why architects weren't so interested in that uh, as a topic, but um, but yeah, there are these next uses, and um, very you know deliberately, all this black wood was designed um, so it could be it could be torn out quite easily and, and replaced. You know, when his grandkids want to make this some other kind of building or something like that, I'm quite fine with that evolution of, of buildings. Yes. Um, 
and that's a great, um, if you're not coming tomorrow, you should come to the talk tomorrow because I'll talk about how um, the 200 years of the Empire State Building site, the history of that site, uh, which goes from a, a farmer's shack all the way to the Empire State Building and beyond. And um, there's plenty of discussion in there about obsolescence um, and what the kind of, so I do a kind of eco anal ecological analysis of all of those phases, successive phases of construction. And it points to the efficacy of, of maintaining and reusing and extending the use of, of all of this energy. Those kinds of preoccupations for me uh, became very clear when I went to Rome and spent a year in Rome. And um, I have other lectures where I talk about, you know, I compare a bridge in Rome, the uh, uh, Ponte Fabricio, which has been in continuous use for 2,000 years. I compare it to like a contemporary North American pedestrian bridge, same 200 foot pedestrian bridge. And also compare it with the Swiss, you know, this very beautiful Swiss um, bridge um, and do the same kind of ecological analysis. And again and again, um, it points to, if you divide something by 100 generations of use, you can do whatever you want. If you're dividing it by two generations, like a North American bridge, we should be much more careful about what we're doing. The extre other extreme end of that is a lecture that John Oxendorf gives, um, which is about ink and rope bridges. And basically, uh, in ink and culture, you would build a new bridge every summer. They'd have a big party and get really drunk and you know weave together ropes and cut down the old bridge and put in the new one. So a, a yearly cycle, but if you're making it out of grass, that actually makes a great deal of sense. So the way that ecological analysis plays out is usually either like it's grass and paper or it's, you know, you're building like a Roman. Um, so a lot of um, buildings I'm interested in tend to be on the, on the scale of durability. Um, we're, we're kind of doing exactly the wrong thing right now. We, we have these in, like that building in Florida, very energy intensive buildings that last for about 65 years, maybe 100 years, maybe 30 years. Um, so we have this kind of obsolescence um, designed into our practices that are um, very, very problematic. Um, so come tomorrow, you can hear that story. Yeah. Yes. So the question generally is about kind of maintenance and how does that fit into this project, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, for better or for worse, I think for better, all of these projects that I design and build, I also maintain uh, for these clients. And so, for instance, this building, because it's, um, sorry, it doesn't matter, because this wood is all, you know, it's pretty dry when I install it, but of course it still has quite a bit of moisture in it and it's going to continue to dry, especially as it's in the exposed to the sun um, in this orientation. Um, so for instance, the part of the structure is that there's threaded rods running through this um, stack of wood every six feet. And so every time I go out there, every summer I go out there, I take a big wrench up there and I tighten up this wall. And it's shrunk about two inches since I originally built this, right? So there's a lot of issues about like windows and how things you know meet to accommodate all of that kind of movement. I bring that up because that's part of its maintenance is tuning it up like that. Um, and I've made uh, acoustic recordings of that tuning um, uh, as uh, compositions with one of my composer friends. Um, but that's, of course, to keep the, the layers, you know, c tightly compressed on each other, which is this, you know, the rain and air um, block uh, barrier in this particular system. So those things are like quite tightly interconnected. There's not, it's not like a structural issue or a building envelope issue, it's all one thing. And that's, um, I guess, one of the primary lessons of this is that um, right now the architects have organized themselves in such a way that they're always kind of chasing the building industry. Um, you have you know, 10 or 20 layers in your wall. There's no way you can know much about that. Um, and you're doing everything you can to get the right thing in the right place at the right time. Etc. Um, basically, we were trained um, throughout the 20th century um, to basically add, every time we have a problem, add another layer, add another component, add another consultant, and in the end, add another lawyer to the process, right? Because uh, all of these things are going to fail, um, all, each of these systems. 
So from a kind of, given that kind of political economy, I'd rather you know much more about six inches of wood than the six or 16 layers in that wall, right? And, you know, this is one very small building. It's, but I, and I'm not telling you to build this way, but I think there's lessons that one could extend from this kind of thinking of, of following various systems through um, that would start to change that political economy. Uh, one of the biggest, most important things I can tell you, one of the momentous, most momentous things that have occurred in the history of recent architecture is the shift from building buildings out of materials to sh building buildings out of products, right? So now we build buildings of s with stuff that has as many corporate properties as they do physical properties or structural properties, right? So it's all the more complex to follow the, the, these kinds of systems once you're dealing with complex products rather than, I mean, materials are enough. It's taken me a couple decades to understand even just the most basic things about what wood really does in our world, right? And how it really relates to that forest or et cetera. And how I can intervene in those complex systems as architects in a, in a, in a productive way. Um, so when we get to these like multi-layered walls, I have no idea where to get started. I don't know which one of those layers matters more than others, et cetera. I could do a huge analysis of it like that uh, building in Florida. Um, but I, I prefer to get us to start thinking about much more simple systems that can work in much more complex and profound ways. And I think that's something that um, there's a reason why Vitruvius, Alberti, Palladio, they all spent so much time talking about materials, the sourcing materials, when to cut down a tree, when to quarry stone, etc. When I was a student, when I first read those books, I had no idea. I wanted to like, get, get me to the architecture. I wanted to know about the temple. Um, but they spent multiple books. And of course, Alberti ends up, his last book is about uh, maintenance and rehabilitation. Um, and I think those are all important lessons for us, that there's only a couple of books in the middle that are about what we would call design, right? Um, so designing these whole systems, I think, is deeply embedded in the discipline of architecture. Um, and I think it could be, once again, in the 21st century, if we wanted to kind of transform how we thought of ourselves and positioned ourselves in the building industry. So I think, you know, some of these lessons, understanding more specifically about how um, some thermal properties work, some more specific things about the carbon cycles of buildings, et cetera, give you different types of agency um, to make cases to clients, uh, to building inspectors, et cetera, for how to make some of this stuff appear in the world in a very different way, right? That's, I mean, that's a big part of it. Alex? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so he's, he's thinking, Alex is thinking about the roof and the climate, all this stuff, and how it relates to this huge scupper uh, that if you're not careful, you can fall through, actually. Um, but yes, the roof is collecting snow and, and shedding rainwater, that sort of thing. There's not that much snow and not that much, or not that much rain, especially. There's, there can be heavy, very heavy snows up there in the winter. Um, but again, this is Colorado. This is 300 sunny days a year, not even partly cloudy days, like sunny days a year. Um, so in this very high altitude, the sun really just starts to destroy materials pretty quickly. Um, so um, that's a part of it. Um, I mentioned those other eight buildings. Um, you know, we're up on this hill, pretty exposed to wind. Um, but you know, like in terms of microclimate, you know, wind basically follows river you know, valleys, uh, you know, morning and afternoon, there's a kind of shift. Um, so most of these buildings are perpendicular to the river, A, to look at them, but also for a very simple cross ventilation. But one of these houses is a house that, or one of these buildings is a house that cantilevers out over the river and puts the kind of living spaces directly in that microclimate. So it's, it's a much more humid, much cooler, you know, probably 10 degrees cooler down in that cantilevered house. Um, than it is up in this, you know. Um, but certainly in the winter, the reason that he can be warm is that huge south-facing. South um, but think about what's happening, Alex. In the morning, I'm charging up that, that huge wood surface with sun in the morning. Um, and a little bit of sun, you know, hits this wall in a kind of almost Cromwell-like way. And then midday, I'm heating up the floor, uh, other parts of the space. And then in the afternoon, I'm heat heating up this part of the wall and the outer face of that so that 
I'm, I'm charging up the, the wood at various times of the day on both sides, so there's penetration depth from each side. Of course, I'm losing it you know, pretty quickly, but, um, but that, that, that those large exposures of wood are, are important in that sense, yeah. So there's, there's and you know, after um, the final point on that, Alex, is that the, after building on this, this being in the same place for, you know, 12, 14 summers in a row, something like that, I really got to know the climate quite well. Um, I can tell you um, whether, you know, when storm clouds are building up behind certain peaks, whether or not it's going to break this way or that way, whether or not it's going to rain on us or whether we can keep working construction, even though it's raining on both sides of this kind of micro valley here. Um, so it, it really got quite specific, you know, um, the sense of uh, microclimates. Um, connected to that is into that kind of occupation and construction is that uh, with this, you know, as I'd be building this, uh, the client would come up on the weekends and we'd have these great parties and S Saturday was on the construction site talking about what's happening and then Sunday was always drawing the next project, usually full scale, and thinking about the microclimate questions and, and views and that sort of thing. Um, so like all these window boxes were, you know, very carefully surveyed on site and you know, it's the only way you can really design something like that um, is full scale. Um, yeah. Way in the back. Yeah. Okay, so the question is how do you put this thing together? Um, so that the individual stacks, of course, have that little tongue and groove, which is just to help keep some air and water out. Um, so I mentioned that there's the threaded rod every six feet. So you can imagine, you know, some of these six by eight timbers are, are 18 feet long. So they're quite heavy, a couple hundred pounds. So you have to lift them up over the threaded rod and then drop them down on top of you from the previous course. Um, and then I have um, like 12 inch long log screws, which are very high tensile strength um, screws that you drive with a very large drill. Um, and what's interesting about that is basically, like, a, you know, an 18-foot timber is going to be quite twisted because the last thing a piece of wood is is straight, right? We take conical objects and then try and make straight stuff out of them. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's quite twisted. So what I do is I start on one end, and I fasten that with the screws, and then I work my way down. And if I drive those screws at slightly different angles, I can get that wood to kind of twist back into place. Um, so we, we work down as a team twisting this wood back into some kind of shape that architects like, which is a straight wall. Um, so we do that again and again. Um, some people put like strips of foam, you know, strips of petroleum in between each layer. I just put the wood on top of each other, screw it up, and then, but the important thing is to be able to have a way of tightening it over time. Um, in this case, there are no pipes and wires um, in this building, so it's, it's sort of a non-issue. Um, even the building in Vermont has no pipes and wires. Um, I, it's not much of an answer, but in these particular kind of contexts, um, you just go to bed when it's dark and you wake up when it's light. It's <laughs> I have like the big, the big wire in the sky, I guess, um, that keeps it pretty simple. The, the one in Vermont has a, a couple solar panels just to charge a, a refrigerator and a, you know, your, your iPad or whatever addiction you have, yeah. Um, okay, yes? This one? The big window? Yeah, all right, let me find it. I don't know where it went. Um, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> All right, let's go. Let me let me find the right slide um, for that. So, um, yeah. So there's a couple steel moment frames, north and south. So the, the the door frames and window frames are steel moment frames. So that's a four by eight steel tube and a two by four tube on the on the face, um, and that's all bolted together, and and that's it. We get a little bit, you know, a little bit of a shear wall from this north facing panel, um, but. What's that? Are you are you nervous? <laughs>
Yeah, this is. Um, Yeah, I mean, it, it's part of it. I mean, that is part of the logic of the building is some movement is fine. But um, this is a, I've, I've worked on, on several of these projects with this uh, quite talented structural engineer in Denver named Chuck Keyes. And um, he, I've never fully understood it either, but he has um, a theory on two, on two moment frames, which I don't understand, but work. Um, <laughs> But there's the, the cantilevered house also has a kind of moment frame on the end of it for obvious reasons. Um, but he has great confidence in um, the role of heavy tubes top and bottom as part of that, um, you know, the, and how it connects to the diaphragm and, uh, and all of that. So he's very preoccupied with, with this and with this. Um, the, and of course, the, the two by fours all have slotted connections so that the wood can shrink over time but, and still have the connection. It's, um, yeah, that, that's another thing too. It's like, you can make wood that can stay very long. You just have to build a giant tube to the height of the wood, and that's what it was. Otherwise, it's big. So exactly. Yeah, so those all have like three inch slots yeah. to anticipate that. So um, they're, they're attached, but not overly attached so that they can slide, right? Um, th I mean, that's probably the most intricate this, this particular building gets for sure. I mean, there, this, um, it's one of the, th the, the, in the same way that, the, that, let's say, this more massive chunk of wood can absorb some heat and re release it over time, it does the same thing with moisture, right? So there is a whole set of calculations for moisture buffering that um, I could do on this, but um, in this extremely dry climate, especially, I'm not so worried about. I could be more worried about that um, with my buildings in Vermont. Um, but, um, you know, when I'm, you know, heating them up in the winter when this might be an issue, it's it's all you know pretty much sensible like heat gains. Like it's it's pretty. Um, I'm not too worried about it. Um, yeah. In response to Eric Martini's question about level of bracing, that's why I thought your chest section could possibly down there do it as well as the deep formation in your roof. Yeah. That it's on the exactly. Floor. No, the fact that there's a kind of, uh, a, let's, it's not like, well, it is three-dimensional, but it's like it's kind of two-and-a-half-dimensional diaphragm on the roof. It was quite interesting, Kirk, like, you know, when it was just the walls and no diaphragm on the roof, you know, like you could, you could move this wall, you know. But once that diaphragm, once we attached that diaphragm, um, I, it became so much more rigid. Um, Exactly. So it's it's kind of yeah. It's like two foot deep, sort of, right? At that. And the lower part, the steps actually can do it as well. The steps. I mean, you could easily make the steps do do some of that kind of work because it is, you know. It doesn't look like it's quite attached to the wall. Yeah, it's it's lightly attached, but you could easily you could start to use those stairs if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, that that I was that's something I didn't really think through as the effect of that kind of, um, you know, thicker diaphragm in that sense. Yeah. It, it had a huge effect, and and there's a slight difference between how much you can shake the the di like the kind of curved side of the wall and the flat side of the wall. There's a you can kind of just physically notice a, a slight difference in the deflection, but it's 145. Ed. Um, I do, Ed. I do. Um, but that, when, when, I, when I call the lecture R values or not R values, I am putting a different value proposition on the table. Um, I know things will be, be built cheap and quick and that sort of thing, and um, I do some of that work. Um, but I think there's at least, from a pedagogical and, and, and professional point of view, there's you know, some role in thinking through some of these other systems and the value systems associated with them. Because let's just 
in a different political context, we might have a carbon a carbon based economy, and then some of these things would become like this would definitely win out. This would be the so called cheapest building for sure uh, by orders of magnitude. So um, some of these things can happen, some of these things might not happen, but I still want to think them through. Um, but you're, you're totally right. There, there would be a cheaper way to build this building for sure. There always is, yeah. Okay, I'll stick around. I know it's the end of class. You guys probably have studio or something. If you want more questions, I'll be up here for a little bit. But thank you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>